Mary Jane Woodger, EDD, is a professor of church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. Born and raised in American Fork in Salt Lake City, Utah, Mary Jane has always had a great love for teaching. After obtaining a bachelor's degree in home economics education, she taught home economics and American history in Salt Lake City. In 1992, she completed her master's of education degree at Utah State University, and in 1997, she received from Brigham Young, from Brigham Young University a Doctor of Education degree in Educational Leadership with a minor in Church History and Doctrine. She was honored by Kappa Omicron Nu, I don't think I said that right, but with the Award of Excellence for her dissertation research entitled The Educational Ideals of David O. McKay. Since then, Dr. Woodger has written and published several books, including three books about the life and teachings of David O. McKay, as well as a book on the timely subject of self-esteem. She has also authored numerous articles on doctrine, historical, and educational subjects. These articles have, ap have appeared in numerous academic journals, as well as the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, the Church News, the Enzyme, and the Religious Educator. Recently, Dr. Woodger received the Best Article of the Year Award from the Utah Historical Society, as well as the Brigham Young University Faculty Women's Teaching Association Award. Dr. Woodger's current research interests include 20th century church history, Latter-day Saint women's history, and church education. On a more personal note, I had the privilege of taking a class from Mary Jane several years ago and remember asking her what, what I needed to do to become a religion professor. As a young student, I never would have imagined that I would be asked to introduce her as the Alice Louise Reynolds lecturer. I am grateful for the female role model she was and is, and am honored to say that I am now her colleague. Thank you, Mary Jane, for the many contributions you have made and will continue to make. I kind of feel uh, like I know what it will be to, to be at my funeral. Uh, what, a, what a wonderful day I've had, especially appreciative of my students who would come and listen to me when they don't have to. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk about my first introduction to George Albert Smith. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, we had a couple who each uh, year would sponsor someone for the Dairy Princess contest. And I was pretty excited because they chose me. And of course, there was only three girls in my ward who were seniors, and the other two really didn't own a dress, so it wasn't a hard choice. But I was so excited, and I began to practice my wave. I was sure I would become Dairy Princess. And I said to my dad, Daddy, I've watched the Miss America contest, and I know that at the end when you become a finalist, which of course I will be, they ask you a question. What if I can't think of an answer? And my dad said, well, let me teach you a quote. And I promise you that this quote will cover any situation. And so the quote is, and notice it really isn't George Albert Smith's because back then you could plagiarize and it was okay. My dad thought it was his. It's actually Ralph Waldo Emerson, but he taught me the quote. Here's the quote. That which we persist in doing becomes easier, not because the nature of the task has changed, but because our ability to do has increased. And you'll notice that I still remember it. So I went to the Dairy Princess contest, and I got in the finalists. All right, there was only 11 women, and I was one of the 11, and all 11 were finalists. But nevertheless, <laughs> I was in the finalists, and I had my blue sequin outfit on, and I was so excited, and I was prepared with the quote. Well, as they started going down the row asking questions, it suddenly dawned on me that they weren't asking questions at all like Miss America. They were actually asking questions about the dairy industry for which I knew nothing. <laughs> but I looked down at my dad and he promised that that quote would cover any situation. So as they got to me, the question was, tell us what pasteurization has done to advance the dairy industry. <laughs> I thought about it, I thought about the quote and I said, well, when the cows first go out to the pasture, it's hard for them. But the more they pasteurize, the easier it becomes, not because the nature of pasteurization has changed, but because the cow's ability to do that task has increased. <laughs> Nevertheless, I did not make Dairy Princess. <laughs> well, um, my first introduction to George Albert Smith. Since then, I have been come enamored with him, especially with his uh, challenges in life and it is that which I wish to speak of today. 
Though many apostles, such as Spencer W. Kimball, Howard W. Hunter, have found their service curtailed by physical limitations, few have been incapacitated to the point that George Albert Smith was, both physically and emotionally. Though in 1903, at the young age of 33, he was called to be a general authority, he suffered from a variety of health problems. Of particular significance was his nervous collapse during 1909 to 1914, when he was so incapacitated that he could not serve as a church leader. During his long illness, President Smith was not only unable to work for almost two years, he was unable to communicate through speech. Public speaking was simply impossible. President Smith exemplifies a prescribed pattern of behavior for Latter-day Saints who suffer from illnesses. Their desire to be healed, they receive priesthood blessings, they benefit from the prayers of others, and they plead with the Lord, yet relief does not come. President Smith felt that in his case, relief was not to be secured through medical treatment, but rather through prayer. For three years from 1909 to 1912, he suffered from debilitating conditions that would affect him for the rest of his life. Speaking of this period, he wrote, I have been in the valley of the shadow of death in recent years, so near the other side that I am sure that for the special blessing of our Heavenly Father, I could not have remained here. The nearer I went to the other side, the greater was my assurance that the gospel is true. To say that Elder Smith struggled throughout his life with poor health would be an understatement. When he was called to the apostleship, his father, John Henry Smith, was serving the First Presidency. By the way, they are the only two father and son to serve in the Quorum of the Twelve at the same time. When others accused John Henry Smith of having orchestrated his son's call, his first reaction was, no, I did not. His second statement was, well, he's not healthy. He won't last long. One area of constant concern was his eyes. His personal journal from 1888 until his death in 1951 contains numerous entries and references to vision problems. At the age of 18, he joined a surveying crew line at Green River, Utah, with the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad. Intense summer sun and glare from desert sands caused permanent damage to Smith's eyes. Smith may have had Panagulica, okay, I didn't say it right, but none of you know what it is either. A common uh, malady of people who work in the sun, especially in the southwestern United States or in other dry climates. Most often, artificial tears or mild steroid eye drops will relieve this condition, but these were not developed at that time. Without treatment, growth of a lesion can be excessive, extending over the cornea and impairing vision. In Smith's journal, there is no record of any treatment for his damaged eyes. And after that summer, his vision was never good. Because of his damaged eyes, he declined to further his education because he could not read. Additionally, within the first few months of 1900, he suffered an accident to one of his eyes, which further impaired his eyesight. He went and underwent operations on the damaged eyes each of the following two years after the accident. Though the operations seemed to be viewed as successful, the eye problems and continued. Later photographs of President Smith show one of his eyes primed to veer in a wrong direction. And years later, when he appeared on the cover of Time magazine, a staff worker straightened his eyes using airbrush technology. Imagine a prophet's portrait being airbrushed. Dr. Kurt Gilmore, a medical doctor, who has done extreme, uh, extensive research on George Albert Smith's maladies while he was serving on a church curriculum committee, suggests that he may have experienced a paralysis of the cranial nerve in his left eye. Knowledge of his eye problems began to be well known, both in and out of the church, and before he became an apostle, the condition caused problems with his employment. Part of the problem with George's eyes was that his left eye focused outward and his right eye tried to compensate. In 1907, he underwent another surgery to correct the problem. While the surgery was successful, it produced an altered focus that required a long period of adjustment. Unfortunately, 
he continued to have eye problems that he continued to talk about in his journal. Over and over again, he mentioned the problems. This limitation of eyesight may have taken a toll on his ability to function as an apostle, since reading and correspondence was a major daily duty. Secretary of the First Presidency Francis M. Givens recorded that the eye annoyance also aggravated a nervous condition that had troubled Smith from his childhood. One can understand the general fatigue that also accompanied him as an apostle. The constant traveling was difficult in the early 1900s given the limited modern conveniences. Most accommodations were in members' homes and sleeping in different beds was a source of anxiety for him. In addition, hostesses, bless their hearts, would prepare their best recipes for the visiting general authority, which were usually rich and completely incompatible with his digestion. Fear that he would offend by rejecting food he was served became a constant mental struggle when he visited stakes along the Mormon corridor. To alleviate his distress, he would often carry with him a grain concoction for breakfast. Since Lucy Emily Woodruff had lived with the state of her husband's delicate health for 10 years previous to his call to the quorum, she worried constantly about her husband's fragile health and cautioned him not to overdo. For instance, on April 13, 1902, she wrote, Don't overwork your frail body I warn you so much about this, but I don't know if the warning is heeded at all. However, at the same time, Lucy seems to have been very demanding of her apostle husband's time and energy. For instance, though she wrote in December 1908, quote, I hope you are taking care of yourself, she added. You know that I must have you. I am not good without you. Such pressure seems to have mounted as Lucy placed guilt upon her husband's shoulders for him not being available. The next day after writing the letter above, she reminded her husband, quote, Remember, I have some claim on you as well as the children and public. A few days later, later, she confided, I wish I could ask you about every move that I make. Lucy constantly demanded that her husband be with her. Often she nagged him about his absences and her difficulties with mothering. In 1907, she had complained, I am growing old or weak or nervous or something because I am not brave anymore and I can't carry my worries alone. At least the last week you were home, I know you were worried nearly to death and I feel very bad to think that you went away so worried. Though she said she felt, about burning, felt bad about burning her husband, it didn't seem to stop her behavior. Though she wished she had no heart and no temper, she routinely, routinely told her husband she was a poor manager and that the noise of the children upset her. She warned that she was on the verge of nervous prostration, that she was getting old and her nerves were gone, and that she was mentally imbalanced. While she asked, okay, she's no Emma Ray. While she asked that he just tear those letters up and throw them away, such threats must have taken a toll on him and his constitution. Such whining on her part must have been a difficult cross to bear for a busy apostle who was traveling regularly to various stakes. Her difficulties were certainly not all physically based. Though it was rare in the early 1900s for the general public to have mental illness or emotional disturbances diagnosed, those who were very close to George Albert Smith were aware of some emotional problems. Grandchild George Albert Smith V suggests that his grandfather dealt with depression and had a tendency towards feelings of being overwhelmed and incompetency and difficulties where he could just not pull it all together. Another granddaughter, Shauna Lucy Stewart Larson, grew up in George Albert Smith's home for 12 years. She remembers that when there were great tremendous stresses, mostly having to be of an emotional kind, it took its toll and he would literally have to go bed for several days. Larson maintains that Satan had to attack him in this way because he couldn't get him any other way. And grandson Robert Murray Stewart remembers, there were problems associated with his mental health, just maintaining control of himself. Counseling or other therapies associated with such problems were not available 
to George Albert Smith during his early apostleship. In addition, part of Smith's uneasy health may have been caused by his tendency to take on others' burdens. At one point, he confided to a state president, quote, when things are normal, my nerves are not very strong, and when I see other people in sorrow and depressed, I am easily affected. One of his grandchildren observed that her grandfather took everything so much to heart. Others' problems became such a part of him, and when people he associated with experienced difficulties, it just wiped him out, and he'd have to go to bed for days at a time. His journals indicate an almost compulsive desire to solve other people's problems, and there were many who brought these problems to his attention. In contrast to our generation, when apostles and other general authorities are somewhat protected from the general public, during his tenure, his office was accessible to anyone who walked in off the street. As church members consistently paraded problems before him, he, to, he seemed to personalize other situations. By 1908, he had traveled an average of more than 30,000 miles a year. At the end of 1908, he was afraid he had overworked his body during that year. He had suffered from constant indigestion. His eyes continued to bother him. His lips broke out in cold sores. He had a lame back. His throat was hot and dry. He had painful rheumatism, and he felt weakness of his heart. In January of 1909, when a streetcar neglected to stop for him, he ran to the depot depot with a heavy coat and valise. He caught the train but felt he had been unwise for overexerting himself. My heart seems to be weak this morning. I'm afraid I have overdone during this last year. The re result was that President Smith felt an even weaker heart and so he visited the doctor's office when he got home. The diagnosis was that his heart was not bad but he needed rest. Ignoring the doctor's advice, he continued at a feverish pace. February 24th, 1909, became a turning point in his life. He awoke in pain from head to toe. Dr. Gamble, examining him the next day, diagnosed it as La Grippe, a type of influenza. Though La Grippe produced problems with his weakened body, many believe it was not at the root of his problems. Biographer, biographer Emerson Roy West suggests that he suffered from lupus erythematosus. Okay, close. A rare disease that affects all the tissues of the body and produces chronic weakness. Smith was diagnosed just a few days before his death with this in 1951. Emerson West suggests that he had suffered from the illness for years. Although doctors have speculated on the cause of his health problems, there has never been a definitive diagnosis. In the early 1900s, it was common to stay with the same doctor no matter the illness. Most doctors did not specialize and did not consult with other physicians and therefore had very limited expertise in diagnosis. Many in Smith's family maintain that the prophet's disorders were and still are common in the Smith family line. Granddaughter Martha Hatch suggests that the symptoms displayed by her grandfather can be seen as far back as Asel Smith. For instance, in 1776, Asel was, quote, low in state of health, entirely unable to labor for years. John Smith, his son, also suffered for several years with feeble health, and some thought that his poor health was due to insanity. Hatch also feels that the maladies experienced by her prophet grandfather have been passed down to her. She shares, I'm very like him in physicality. I think you could say that I even resemble him. I've gone through periods of time when I just was quite ill and very sensitive to everything, and I feel quite akin to him. Another grandchild, Shauna Stewart Larson, suggests that the physical problems inherited through the Smith line have to do with stomach problems. She's identified that George Albert Smith, son, George Albert Smith, Jr., and daughter, Edith Smith Elliott, all suffered from stomach ailments. Larson has also had stomach problems and had a part of her stomach removed. She informed, I inherited the stomach problems. I've had it for as long as I can remember, and my stomach has just been a little bit weird. And then, as I got into my life and had some other problems and challenges, it was the first thing to go. So I had some surgery, 
had part of my stomach removed, and because of the scar tissue, I still have problems. I see that in my family. Though physical, oh, I'm really off here. Oh, there you go. That's a good one. Though the physical cause of his distress is uncertain, after studying the records available, Dr. Gilmore is certain that Smith was experiencing also the symptoms of depression. Grandson George Albert Smith V believes that emotional problems may have been passed also from generation to generation. This grandson's father, the prophet's son George Albert Smith Jr., suffered from depression. George Albert Smith V remembers his father getting depression easy and then snapping out of it, and he'd be fine. He also remembers his father suffering from ulcers that were the result of his emotional stresses. George Albert Smith V also shared that he has also had some depression. For him, it has not been as incapacitating as it was for his father or grandfather, but he definitely noticed it. In addition, George Albert Smith's daughters also seem to suffer from the same problems. For instance, in 1918, his youngest daughter, Edith, was confined for two months because of a nervous breakdown. Well, after George Albert Smith's breakdown in the end of February 1909, he finally slowed down and he took a week of bed rest. Fellow apostles administered to him, Lucy hovered over him, group prayers were offered and in his behalf, but he continued in a state of nervous exhaustion. His breakdown was not a surprise to those who knew him. Letters from friends divulged that they knew he had been on a slippery slope of reduced stamina for some time. His uncle, Heber J. Sears, who was a medical doctor, warned about taking it easy. Things could get much worse if George Abbott refused to slow down. In the following letter, he describes the current prescription for nervous problems. Quote, my dear nephew, a letter from your mother brings the sad intelligence that you are down with nervous frustration. I take no satisfaction in saying I told you so, but I do. I wish I could say something that could bring you to the realization of the danger you are in. For years, I have seen the necessity of a period of complete re relaxation and have endeavored to warn you of the consequences that are sure to follow such a period of prolonged tension. Nature is now giving you a warning which you will do well to take. When the nervous system is once broken down, that patient is too often a wreck for life. No class of diseases resists so stubbornly the effects of a physician as nervous diseases. In fact, there is but little hope after they reach a certain stage. Their manifestations cover a wide range from slight nervous instability to insanity. I need but call your attention to the number of good people who have gone insane in your own locality. Isn't this cheerful? in your own locality, in the same field of usefulness that your own efforts are directed in. Insanity is largely on the increase, as statistics will show. And let me whisper a very significant fact in your ear. It is only a step from nervous frustration to insanity. For heaven's sake, George, sidestep or step backward, not forward. Cheat the asylum of a victim. Dump your responsibility for a while before the hearse dumps your bones. The day after he received that stern warning, George Albert listened and he left for California. Things were dramatically different as he stayed in the church's home in Ocean Park. There were no meetings, no visitors, no speeches. Indeed, he spent his time sleeping and walking on the beach. While there, he also saw a doctor in Los Angeles who tried to find the source of his nervous and nervousness and fatigue. The only thing the doctor came up with was that his 12th rib was out of place under the 11th rib. The doctor instructed him to rest, relax, and receive some kind of treatments once a week. This left George Albert in a state of depression, feeling inadequate, letting everyone down around him. The treatment of rest might have actually postponed the cure. That spring, his life was filled with fervent prayers and priesthood blessings. Improvement didn't come, and it seemed that the Lord was turning a very deaf ear to the petitions and heavenward the petition sent heavenward in his behalf. Never before had he experienced unanswered prayers to this degree, and one can assume that his faith must have begun to teeter, if not shake violently. After a bad sinking spell, he sent for the doctor and the elders, who stayed with him all night. With this new aversion to the ocean, Smith decided he wanted to go home. So all the Smiths headed for Utah in August. 
After nearly collapsing three times on the train, he managed to get on a streetcar bound for Los Angeles where he boarded the train then for Salt Lake. On arrival in Salt Lake City, Lucy and the children went home, but the doctor gave orders that he needed to be away from the noisy children in a quiet place where he could sleep outside. The fresh air cure, which seemed to be a remedy for everything, was what the doctors constantly prescribed. President Joseph F. Smith, seeing the distress of his junior corps member, tried to comfort him in a letter. He wrote on September 7, 1909, I do not want you to worry about anything. Please remember what the Lord said to his apostles. Take no thought of what ye shall eat, and etc. I say this to you, the Lord will provide for you, therefore don't worry. But it was Smith's nature to worry. Loved ones tried to help. His father and fellow members of the Quorum of the Twelve and other priesthood bearers gave him numerous priesthood blessings. After one blessing, he seemed a little better, but then he had a nightmare and fell out of bed and collapsed. On September 13th, a Dr. Allen concluded that he must have a strained heart muscle, and so he prescribed a full year of bed rest. Such a diagnosis and prescription seemed too much for George Albert, so he headed for St. George. Five months later found him in a pitiful condition. For five months, he never left his bed. For five months, he never changed out of his bedclothes. For five months, even arranging his bedclothes caused him a nervous chill, and he would faint and become momentarily unconscious. His condition continued to diminish. He experienced constant seeking spells and fell deeper and deeper into depression. Still, those around him tried to exercise faith in his recovery. Temple workers from St. George came twice weekly to give him priesthood blessings. Thousands of Latter-day Saints prayed for his recovery, but he continued to be in a state of nervous exhaustion. The general authorities included his names in their prayer circle, where they fervently remembered him. At one point, a letter was sent from the prayer circle informing George Albert that the Lord seems to take care of those best who do all in their power to intelligently use wisdom of their own selves. Such tactless advice may have left George Albert in an even more reduced emotional state. Depression, discouragement, boredom, they were taking their toll. His impaired eyesight made it impossible for him to read for any length of time, and even if the light would have been good enough in the tent that he was sleeping in outside. In December 1909, during a sinking spell, he had a dream, which he would relate many times, which has become part of the Mormon uh, conferences. After exploring a wooded area, he saw a large man approaching him. By the way, this man uh, weighed 350 pounds. He was uh, George Albert's namesake. After exploring this wooded area, he recognized the man as his grandfather. My grandfather came within a few feet of me. He stopped. His stopping was an invitation for me to stop. Then he looked at me very earnestly and he said, I would like to know what you have done with my name. Everything I had ever done passed before me as though it were a flying picture on a screen. Everything I had done. Quickly, this vivid retrospect came down to the very time I was standing there. My whole life had passed before me. Judging by the frequency by which George Albert rehearsed this dream, it is clear that it served as a constant reminder to him who he was and how he should act. The dream gave him solace and relieved one worry. During his illness, it appears that at times he wondered if it were something he had done that had brought about this trial of ill health. He admitted publicly that he had weaknesses, faults, and shortcomings. But when he was able to answer his grandfather in the way he did, he knew that his conscience was free of any guilt that might have caused divine disapproval. Though many have thought that this dream in December of 1909 was the turning point in his recovery, in reality it served only as a precursor. The real impetus for improvement was, a result, was the result of a change in prayer. Directly after this dream experience, George Albert took a new line of reasoning that would eventually bring about his recovery. His thoughts seemed to center on leaving mortality. Perhaps he was resisting a new call on the other side of the veil. He could not fulfill his assignment in the Quorum of the Twelve 
and maybe his illness was impeding the progress of the quorum, even the church. His place in the quorum added more work for other brethren, and as long as he lived, no one could be called to replace him. Such a line of thinking led him to resolve to ask the Lord to release him through death if recovery was not going to be possible. Maybe all the prayers, the priesthood blessings, the pleading went against the Father's will. So he made a decision. His prayers would change, and he began to pray to be released from his weak body. He resolved to ask the Lord to release him through death if he wasn't going to recover. One night, he confined he confided in his wife that he was going to ask the Lord to release him from his position as an apostle of the Lord, take him home and put someone else more suitable in his place. He asked his wife to join him in that kind of prayer. She related. Apostle Smith told me that he had talked with the Lord in the night and had asked the Lord to release him from his position, whereupon the Lord told him he should come with his wife before him in prayer to petition him. Over tears, I said, I could never consent to pray with him for such a purpose. However, Apostle Smith had the same advice again a few nights later. We discussed this matter again, and I finally consented to pray with him for his release from this life. No one knows what a strain it was on my feelings and my great love for my husband and children to accept such a resignation. To the astonishment of many, this was the turning point of his betterment and health. Apostle Smith recuperated from his long illness from this time on. He received a testimony that he was to live as he was one of the chosen to lead this people sometime in the future. Submission to the Lord's will turned the tide. This was a great turning point in George Albert Smith's life and apostleship. By April 27th, he was getting a little better. He was taking some exercise around the block and his good humor had returned. He wrote to his father, I am not so nervous as when you were here. My stomach still gives me considerable distress, but I can't get another one, so I guess I'll have to put up with it. On May 1st, for the first time in five months, he got dressed, and on May 4th, he and Lucy headed home to Salt Lake. Truly, the turning point in his life and health was in prayerfully submitting to the option of death. The change in his physical and emotional health had nothing to do with medical treatments, psychological counseling, or priesthood blessings. After he changed the way he prayed, there was a marked difference in his mental and emotional attitude, which eventually affected the way he viewed his physical health. One of the hardest handicaps of Smith's illness, however, still had not rescinded. He could not talk privately, let alone publicly. Gradually, during 1911, his ability to speak improved, and on May 11th, he attended two meetings and was able to speak for 10 minutes. Smith still had feelings of inadequacy about the load he was not carrying for the Quorum of the Twelve, but things were slowly getting better, and he was beginning to shoulder some of his former responsibilities. During the year of 1913, his health continued to pr improve. However, to say that his health was restored by 1913 would be an unwarranted exaggeration. During the remainder of his life, he was frail and subject to occasional sieges of illness. But in 1913, there was a definite improvement in his condition and a return to relative normalcy. Though improved, his struggle with fatigue, weakness, influenza, neuritis, and other illnesses would be never ending. In fact, in 1937, he told his son, quote, you are approaching the age when I had my breakdown from which I never recovered. I do hope that you will safeguard your health. You must not take any chances of wrecking your nerves. Smith always worried, worried that his health might decline and the horrible siege of three years of unproductivity would be repeated. During the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, he was a different man than he had been at the beginning of his service. He was never again an invalid that had to be carried to and fro. For the rest of his life, he did struggle with his health, but he learned to slow down when necessary. Over the rest of his life, if there was stress, or if his physical health, he found out that his physical health and stress were intertwined, and he found he had to adhere to certain limits. Generally, few members of the church or close friends to George Albert would have thought he would ever live long enough 
to become the president of the church or live into his eighth decade. It was amazing, given his limitations. That George Albert was able to serve as prophet, seer, and revelator is unquestionable. He was relatively well enough to conduct the church business, business from 1945 to 1950. Speaking of not being able to speak publicly. His attitude during his final illness is reminiscent of what he had learned in 1911. The day of February 4th, 1951, was one of the hardest days he had ever experienced. He called his secretary and dictated the following thoughts. Ah, these are good slides. Last evening and last night were the hardest for me. I felt like perhaps my time had come. If it has, it's all right. If not, I'd appreciate the continuing faith and prayers of the people. Tomorrow is the regular meeting in the temple, and I would like the brethren to lay the matter before the Lord. He became worried that his helpless lingering was bad for the church. A few days before his death, he told his private secretary, Arthur Haycock, I feel perfect, perfectly quiet and at peace. I'm willing to stay or willing to go, whatever the Lord says. There is a lot in the world to do, and we should all be part of it. By the 1st of April, George Albert knew he had taken a turn for the worst. Nurses' notes show he ate very little and was disoriented most of the day. He calmly told members of his family that this was probably the end, and he reiterated how grateful he was for the blessings he had received and for the opportunities he had been given to serve his Father in heaven. On April 4th, 1951, he wrote in his journal, Today is my 81st birthday, the day dawned clear and beautiful. Most of the day, his family encircled him at his bedside, his daughters, his son, and their families. President David O. McKay, counseled in the first presidency, visited, laid his hands upon the prophet's head, and released him. For George Albert, there was no pain at the end. All of a sudden, he just became very tired. When his son and one of the nurses lifted him into a more comfortable position, in his typical humor, he said, be careful that you don't hurt yourselves. President George Albert Smith died at his home in Salt Lake City on the evening of his 81st birthday. For an apostle who in his 30s was incapacitated for over three years to live into his 80s is an anomaly. Certainly, medication, counseling, and other treatments available today would have alleviated some of President Smith's distress. Some psychological treatments have been developed and were available in Utah by 1909, but George Albert never seems to have taken advantage of counseling. Though the diagnosis of his physical maladies or emotional problems was never clear-cut, we can learn much from the study of his reaction to his disabilities. First and foremost, for George Albert, the turning point of his, was his acceptance and ability to deal with particular limitations came from submission and prayer rather than medical treatment. Second, though his personality was prone to over-anxiousness and even guilt-ridden behavior before 1911, after this experience with prayer, those tendencies were held in check and never became as debilitating as they had during his early apostleship. Third, learning through prayer that he had more to do in mortality there was a change in his outlook. Knowing that he had a purpose gave him the necessary positive attitude to help him through those times when either his body was weak or his nerves were agitated. And fourth, George Albert learned when it was necessary for him to take a respite from the stress and strains of his high-profile position. He was able to contribute much to the success of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but at the same time, he came to recognize when he was taxed both emotionally and physically, and he took time to recover. His experience brings faith and hope to those who likewise suffer from physical illness, which often leads to emotional decline, inactivity, and inability to serve in church callings. His experience gives us an example of a prescribed pattern of behavior for Latter-day Saints who suffer from maladies, long to be healed, receive priesthood blessings, are prayed over, plead with the Lord, and relief does not come. In our day, many Latter-day Saints are faced with challenges and commitments which 
where much is demanded of their time and energy and personalities. By looking at the lifetime of service of George Albert Smith, we can learn how even with such tendencies towards nervousness and hyperactivity and stress and physical weakness, we can still serve faithfully and have worthwhile and abundant lives. Thank you. <laughs>